So my first open mic was in Sacramento at a place called The Comedy Spot. And it was like an improv and stand-up club, like maybe like 10 people. Wow. And I maybe got like three laughs. <laughs>, <laughs> But unlike other musically gifted Filipinos, he's taking a different approach in his career path in Hollywood. I love it. Dania Beach. I'm not gonna lie. I, I love this. I'm just kidding. I've never heard of this city until tonight. At like bar shows, you have to try to kind of fight the audience into paying attention. Yeah. So that was the first time I, I realized a new skill that you have to have in stand up is like controlling the crowd. Oh, how did you guys meet? What's your story? Jollibee? Is, this, is that for real? You were on Netflix in 2018, right? You have yeah. a, you're a star on the show, The Comedy Lineup, yeah. right? Being able to have the Netflix brand in your story helped a lot. The last three years have really been where like things like took off. How do you stand comedy? Do you think your social media clips have had a way bigger impact than Netflix did? Honestly, like, yeah. Respect to you, like, being a stand-up comedian is like a really hard career. I've been doing stand-up for 12 years. Do you think if you just told your parents straight up, like, I'm doing stand-up and I'm not doing dentistry, do you think they would have been unsupportive? I kind of tricked my parents a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> now you just close on a badass house. How much you buy it for? I don't know if my the realtor that we worked with is going to like this or not. Ooh, baby. Look for a guy with a mortgage And even if he renting, that's okay <laughs> Alright man, well thanks for coming on bro Yeah, thanks for having me man So, how long have you been in San Diego for? So about a year About so, a year? Yeah, we moved here in September of 2022 and stayed in Airbnb for like a month in North Park, like trying to find places. And then we still couldn't find anything. This is for, for rent in the beginning. Yeah. And then uh, we like stayed in hotels even for a few weeks until I finally found my spot in South Park. Sweet. Yeah. And now you're, now you just close on a badass house in Wind and Sea or Bird yeah. Rock? Yeah, Wind and Sea, like it's probably closer, it's between Bird Rock and the like south part of La Jolla. So it's, I would say it's probably more Wind and Sea. More Wind and Sea? Yeah, like walkable to that, that beach right there. Got it. That's awesome. Yeah. How much you buy it for? Bro, so I don't even, I, I don't know if my, the realtor that we worked with is going to like this or not, but it was listed at, I want to say 1.4 uh -huh. and we got it at 1.2. Really? Yeah, man. Wait, that's a really good deal out there. I know. I, know. I, I don't see things trading for less than two million out there. Dude, it was the perfect storm. So it was like one. It's a townhome, so it's connected to another property. Yeah. And so I think that's probably why it was one point four. But it's got like high ceilings, which we, what is what we really liked. The reason it it got brought down was we came in like the first weekend. I was like, oh, this place is gonna go fast. They got two offers, and then those two people in the middle of their deal eventually backed out for other reasons. Yeah. And so at that point, the seller just wanted to sell the place. And so we were in this perfect position because mm. they also had bought another place that they were renovating. So you had a motivated seller. Yes, because I think they didn't want to have to pay those two mortgages while they're renovating. And so we just got really lucky, like the timing of it all. And it was a thing where it's like, I wanted them to have a good deal too. Yeah. But we were at a point too, where we were like, you know, I was going on tour, like my income varies like year to year. So I was yeah. like, let's, we started out looking really high and with interest rates and everything, that number slowly started to go <laughs> down and down. Yeah. Like, all right, this feels good. This feels nice. Yeah. So we gave the number that we were like, I would feel really happy with this number. Like as we, as I tour, like even if things fluctuate. So we just threw out that number. And um, I remember I was like, it was kind of a, like a, a shot in the dark. We weren't sure if that was going to be good or not for them. Yeah. And then my cousin calls me the next day, who is my, my realtor. And uh, he was like, Hey bro, they accepted. I was like, no way. Let's That's do it. Sick. Yeah. So it was really just like so many things came together for that, for yeah. that to happen. And did you, were you just like, was it sitting on the market or did your cousin send it to you? How'd you find it? I don't, I forget if it was my cousin, my girlfriend or me. We were all like, all looking. All searching hard. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, I don't know if that's how it is for you usually, like when you're working with a client, like 
they'll send you a few things. You'll send them a lot of things. But mm -hmm. um, I think it was like a mix of all of us. I was the first to go see it because he was, I think he was busy that day. And uh, and I, I saw it and was like, I think this is going to go quick. So I'm just going to go. I actually saw it before they even had pictures up. Whoa. There was just the listing. And I just went based on like the area. The price. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's cool. Do you have to put a lot of work into it? Uh, as far as renovations go? Yeah. yeah. No, not too much. Yeah. Uh, the main thing we're going to try to do is, is build a yard because we have a dog. Nice. So they have like a little patch of like dirt and like plants and everything, but it's not closed off. So we just need to like, like build a fence around it and stuff. Nice. Yeah. Man. How many bedrooms is it? Yeah. I'm so, just amazed by how cheap you got that dude, property. It, so this is other thing, it, it's not big, you know, like you can come in and uh, I was t I'm telling all my friends, like when we have the housewarming, you just walk in, do a little spin. That's the tour. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, it's like, it's listed as a two bedroom. Uh -huh. In reality, it's really like a one bedroom and a loft. Okay. Because it's not closed at the got top. Got it, got it. And that's, we're debating like, do we want to close it? But I kind of like the, that it's a loft. But if we have guests over, there's not a ton of privacy for them. Yeah. So we're, we're figuring that out. But um, yeah, so it's two bedrooms, two bath listed. Nice. Yeah. So for the people that don't know you, how did you make the money to buy, you know, a house, in one of the best areas and I mean the best area in San Diego, in my opinion. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, it's honestly, it's still like, doesn't feel real because I haven't been able to live inside of it yet. Like we yeah. don't have the keys, but so it's funny, like whenever people say, oh, it's like the best neighborhood, all this stuff. I'm like, I, I don't even know if it's, re it's real yet. It doesn't feel real. But, um, as far as like being able to afford it, I've been doing stand up for like for 12 years and the last three years have really been where like things like took off with like posting on social media. I mean, like you, you know, you've been building your brand through social media even more too. Mm -hmm. It's that thing where like I was always doing stand up, like you were doing real estate. Yeah. But I think posting on social media helped increase it even more where it, like it was like a cycle of people are finding the clips online. So now they're coming to the shows people coming to the shows allows me to make more clips online. And yeah, it just, um, the online like part of it really helped a lot. Got it. So you've been doing it for 12 years. Mm -hmm. Um, where was your first show? Okay. So my first open mic was in Sacramento at a place called the comedy spot, Sacramento comedy spot. Uh huh. And it was like an improv and stand up club. Yeah, man. I, uh, it was, a, it was a show for like, like maybe like 10 people. Wow. And I maybe got like three laughs. <laughs>, <laughs> and in my head, like, you know, when you start out, you're, you're just, you don't really know. In my head, I was like, dude, I killed it. Oh my God, I'm so good at this. I got like, like one, like three laughs in five minutes, it, which is nothing, by the way. And then my, I did another show and it was okay. And then my third show, I bombed super hard. And that's when I was like, oh, this is hard. <laughs> like, <laughs> I did like a bar show and um, at like bar shows, you have to try to, kind of fight the audience into paying attention. Yeah. So that was the first time I, I realized like a new skill that you have to have in stand up is like controlling the crowd. Mm. Um, um, well from that, I mean, you were on Netflix in 2018, right? Yeah. You, you have yeah. a, you're a star on the show, the comedy lineup, yep. right? Yep. Yep. How did you get that gig? Yeah. So that one, there's this festival called just for laughs and, uh, it's almost like, a it's like a big industry festival in comedy. And I got this thing called new faces where like the industry comes out and sees all the up and coming comics. And I like the Netflix people were there. They had this show coming out. They hit up my manager like, Hey, is he interested in submitting a tape for this? And, uh, yeah, I submitted a tape and I found out while I was in the Philippines on vacation, like, like I got it. So, wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Did that like change your, did it like, increase like the trajectory of your career by a lot too like i'm sure a lot of people knew you because of that show right yeah, yeah yeah so i would say what that helped with the most was having like credibility just being able to have the netflix like brand yeah in your kind of story helped a lot and uh and yeah like i had a, a good boost of like following it still wasn't though like not what it was today as far as like that boost because i will say like I did it and then I thought like the next day it would be a tour like I'm doing now. But then I was like, oh man, I'm still, uh, still gotta go to this bar over here. <laughs> <You> know, like, <laughs> or like, go do this like college for like 20 kids. 
But it was, I think there's a lot of things as a stand-up, depending on your career, where you do like, you have like little, you're chipping away and like slowly going up, slowly going up. And you have that feeling where like, oh, when will, when will like, I don't know, when will it feel like I've, I've made it, you know? Yeah. And then, um, so like I, at that point I was still there. It was, it was interesting where it was like, I could, I was making a living. I had an apartment in LA, like by no means was like a, a starving artist, but it felt like I was still, I was still like waiting. Yeah. And that could have been a, you know, an internal like psychological thing where it's like, Oh, you should just be happy, you know? Yeah. But I think as far as the like level that I thought I could reach, it wasn't, it wasn't quite there yet after that. But I will say like, there's some OGs that like saw that and, and follow me now from then. And like, I'm super grateful for like, for the people that I found at that time. Do you think your social media clips have had a way bigger impact than Netflix did? You know, honestly, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's so funny to say that now because I'm like recording a special in the winter. Yeah. And so I'm all like, should I even say that? But it's true. Like that the online stuff helped build the touring and just like, the fan base probably most really of anything yeah wow yeah I, I mean dude like being a like respect to you like being a stand-up comedian is like a really hard career like mm. so many people try to get in they get out you know what i mean it's similar to real estate like for sure people yeah. try to get in they get, you know it's they find out it's a lot of work there's a lot of blood sweat and tears yeah. you got to put in all your energy into it and they're like you know what i'm not made for this i can't take the variety and in income like you talked about right, right? you go it's up like and down. feast or famine it's all on you you're like a hunter gatherer i always call it yeah exactly so like the first year I, I know your story is that you were a music teacher and then you went into comedy mm -hmm. so like your first year were you still like getting income from being a music teacher and then like you did like kind of stand up on the side and then it just became yeah. bigger and bigger yeah so i was in college when i started and then okay. my first job out of college actually i worked on a farm first okay and then i i there's a farm in Hawaii. I lived in Hawaii for a year at this like really rural island. But then I came back to Sacramento. I was teaching music like at a voice studio. And then I'd also go out and like teach at schools. And I was doing stand up at night. And eventually my boss was like, hey man, you gotta pick, you gotta pick one. <laughs> like, cause, cause I started building the road more. I started going the road more. Yeah. And I would kind of reschedule lessons to spend a week like in Oregon or Washington or something. Yeah. And he was like, Hey, you can't keep doing that. You got to pick one. And I, I chose stand up at that point. And I, my goal was basically, you know, I, my goal wasn't to like get rich or anything in the beginning. Like I will say like it, it was helpful to try to find like money in this job. But in the beginning it was like, if I can make, what I'm making at this job, like teaching music, all that stuff in stand up, then I'll, I'll be happy. And so I just got enough gigs to like, I did the math. I was like, okay, this is how many gigs I need to do a month to be able to, to do that and afford yeah. a, a place. And eventually it reached that. And then I was like, Oh, let's just keep trying that. Like maybe I can make, uh, this salary or my whole family is dentists. So like eventually it was like, maybe I can make like a dentist salary, you know? <laughs> and so I just kept kind of like putting these little benchmarks of like, cause there's no, um, like clear one path. I'm sure for you too. Yeah. So I, I remember I, I thought of it in the beginning, like, okay, the first four years is like, if it's dental school, I was like kind of thinking of that track cause my parents really wanted to do dental school. Mm -hmm. so okay. Like first four years is, is the first part of dental school. And then you specialize. And this is where you really start working and making money like around this year. And so I kind of felt like if I'm at this stage, income wise or like skill wise, that's where I would be if I was a dentist too. So I'm okay. Like you're like comparing like what, where you'd be in life if you were a dentist versus if you're a stand up comedian. Exactly. That's yeah. funny. And like at 10 years is where I think a lot of comics kind of like find their voice really. Um, you can find it before oh. then, but like at 10 years is where you like, I guess you really know your craft and like yeah. how you do it and what makes you stand out a bit. And so when I got to that point, I felt like really content with like the skill part of it. That's really interesting. Yeah. So your parents growing up, Asian parents, like, right. Yeah. They wanted you to become a dentist. Yeah. They pushed yeah. you to go that direction. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Like, uh, because my mom, uh, is a dentist and then both my brothers ended up going to, into dentistry too and their wives. So it was literally mm -hmm. like all dentists. Yeah. My, uh, my aunt and uncle are very successful dentists mm -hmm. in Walnut Creek. Oh and yeah. yeah. They, like she crushes it, but she works like all the time. Yeah. And 
my mom and my dad not having money, like they saw how much money my aunt was making. And they're like, mm -hmm. you need to be a dentist. Like you got to be a doctor. Like they're like yeah. trying to tell me to like go the pre-med route. Yeah. So I, I, I connect with that on a personal level. Well, I think there's something with Asian parents, like the love language is just like, like how much money does this make? I know. You know? Yeah. Like they they want to make sure that you're financially secure for sure. And like a prestigious title, right? Like yeah. engineer, lawyer. They want to be doctor. able to like when they go to a family party, like yeah, yeah. have something to tell. It's you know, ego. Their friend. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's ego. Like, what's your son doing? Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So exactly. for so for you with real estate, right? Like, was there like any pressure to do other stuff? outside of real estate were your parents like supportive right away or no they were extremely unsupportive oh really like my mom like disowned me for like a year no way because like because you weren't doing dentistry or yeah yeah because right, like um my third year of school i changed majors okay and i didn't tell my mom for a little bit because i was so scared to tell her yeah and when i told her like we didn't talk for like a year wow and all she would do her only form of communication was like sending me like job postings of like yeah. dental assistant or like a no real way. job. Wow. And that's like all she'd send me in like the hardest year of my life. Yeah. Yeah. So do good for you for going. It's, it is a thing where it's like you go through these tests and like storms to see how bad you really want it. Oh yeah. You know, like with anything. Yeah. 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 Did you go through like a different experience or the same experience? Um, my, I kind of tricked my parents a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I, I, so I was like, I told them that, I was gonna like let me just do stand up for like two more years, and then I'm gonna move to the Philippines and go to dental school. That's what my brothers did. Mm. They went to de dental school in the Philippines. Interesting. Like give me like two two more years. I was even like working at their office in the in the front office, like to like kind of as like a, another supplemental like day job. Yeah. And uh, and so I kind of like bought more time, and then I got my first like TV credit within that time, and so I was able to say like I was gonna go to dental school for enough time to get established in stand up and then be like, well, mm. let me like keep going a little yeah. further. Yeah. Do you think if you just told your parents straight up, like I'm doing stand up and I'm not doing dentistry, do you think they would have been unsupportive? I mean, I think they would have been maybe not as straightforwardly, but in their own way, they would have, they would have, but like they they were, they were very supportive in certain ways. Like they would come to shows and stuff like that when I was starting out in Sacramento I think it was more of, um, they also saw that like I was kind of my own ship in a way. Yeah. Where like after college, I like lived in Hawaii for a year and did that like this farming thing, which yeah. was so not on the track that they wanted me to do. Where'd you go to college? Uh, UC Davis. UC Davis? Yeah. Nice. So up north. And then I went to like, I backpacked around Asia and Europe for like a year after like that trip. Like I came home did work and then I like went back kind of traveling. Wow. And so I think at that point they were just like, all right, this guy's just crazy, dude. Free spirit. Yeah. We can't, con <laughs> we can't control you. Yeah. <laughs> were you a yeah. rebellious kid growing up? No, it no. was the reverse. So I was like the like studious kid growing Same. up and like the good kid. Yeah. But at 17, I, I, I switched, like I got into this car accident in high school where my friend was driving. He starts swerving. He was like, uh, I said something. I was like, oh, yeah, like, be careful that the car might lose control. Yeah. And he was like, oh, no, it's too low to the ground to, like, lose control. Watch this. Like, famous last words. Oh. And he starts swerving. And then we lost control and, like, went over the divider. Oh, and my. And got hit by oncoming traffic. So it was, like, what? like T-boned on the back on my side. I'm in the back passenger seat. And so I broke my sternum, my ribs, all this stuff. And, uh, wow. So I was like, I was in the hospital for a few days and I remember there was a moment where I was like one, when I'm being wheeled to the room, but also just in my room, I'm like looking up at the ceiling and I'm like, my, my, one of my lungs was almost collapsed. Even they were telling me you got to breathe in deep. Otherwise like your lung could collapse. So I was like looking at the ceiling. I'm like, it's, it's hurting to breathe. And I remember like talking to God, even I was like, Hey man, I swear, if I get through this, I'm going to make my life worth it. It's like a Saving Private Ryan moment. So I'll, I'll, you know, I'll like follow whatever my passions are. I'll like make wow. time with people. So from then on, like kind of consciously, but also like un subconsciously where I saw that life is really short. I was like, you know, going after grades, all that stuff. I'm not really doing it because I want to do it. I'm doing it because I think that's what my parents want me to do and what they tell me is important. 
So for, I almost flunked out my senior year of high school. I almost didn't graduate. Wow. I like would skip class like half of the year. <laughs> like, I, would, I would drive to school. And on the way there, I'd be like, you know what? I kind of just want to go to the fish hatchery today. And I would, like, <laughs> I would go hang out and like watch the fish, dude. And, uh, and then like uh, my principal eventually called me in and was like, hey, you're not going to graduate if you keep doing this. I was like, oh, shoot, I should try to finish. Yeah. Um, but at my senior year, I became more about like performing came out music was all about like spending time with my friends and people probably to an extreme like that that wasn't super good and now it's more balanced where like i see the importance of chasing after what you love and like making your life count like being of service to people but not in a way that's like so reckless that i'm gonna like yeah lose a job or like ruin my family or something yeah wow that's that's crazy man thanks for sharing that story yeah for sure for sure how long did it take you to recover from like the, the like the damage of that crash? Like, do you have like a concussion too and stuff? Yeah, so I don't know like the brain part of it. I know they did tests, but they never they didn't find anything crazy. But I will say like, I felt like it was a lot harder to focus on school too at the time. Mm -hmm. um, physically, like my sternum, I, I played lacrosse in high school, and then I couldn't play my senior year because of that injury. So. I would say for a few years afterwards, I had like residual pain and to the point where I was like, I should go to the doctor for this, but I never did. And then eventually it was like, I just got used to it or it like dissipated. Man, that's crazy. I have a similar story. I, yeah. I played football in high school mm -hmm. and it was summer of my sophomore year and we were playing um, like a seven on seven tournament where like no pads, you're just like, you know, wide receivers and quarterbacks are playing. Yeah. And I went up and caught a ball um, like the beginning of this tournament and this dude like ran full speed and like pushed me and my head hit the turf head first Ooh. and I was knocked out for like at least a couple minutes. Oh geez. And everything just went like black for a little bit. I couldn't see. And my vision's never been the same since. Wow. Like ever since then, like I have like a little bit of like blurry spots in my vision. Jeez. Yeah. And I couldn't, my junior, senior year, I had a terrible time focusing oh, in sure. school. Like, I'm I sure. just couldn't focus. It changes your life. It's yeah. like your connection to just everything. Yeah, yeah. So, like, I feel like that kind of, like, really, that was, like, one of my big inflection points where, like, damn, mm. like, I got to, like, change kind of who I am just because, like, I yeah. wasn't, like, you, yeah, I wasn't happy with school. I wasn't happy with that stuff. But, like, after I had, like, that bad of an injury, I was, like, damn, like, you could die at any moment. That's yeah. where I kind of had that, like, aha yeah. moment. You realized it. And um, I thought I was going to die that day. It was crazy. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was nuts. Well, how old were you? I was 16. This is around the same time. Yeah, I was 16. Ooh, that gives me goosebumps. Yeah. Wait, so, so okay, so um, before then you were saying the same thing. You were kind of in that studious route. Yeah, what did you, super studious. What was like the path at the time? Like medicine or what did you think it was going to? You know, it was similar to you. I was just like... My parents, my whole life, taught me to be studious and that mm -hmm. if you got good grades, you'd be successful. Yeah, right. So like it's that like, was it's like A's equals yeah, you're gonna be rich and successful and whatever. Exactly, yeah. and that's all I knew as a kid, right? When yeah. you're 16, 15, like all you know is like what your parents kind of tell you and mm -hmm. a little bit of what your friend group tells you, but you know you're with your family every single day, every single night. Yeah. So what they instill in you is what you believe in. So that's all, all I you believed know. in. Yeah. Yeah, that's all I knew. Wow. Yeah. And so after that, like, how did that? change for you like outlook wise i just like started becoming a lot more curious about other stuff like mm. another big moment was in college when i it's kind of funny when i did uh shrooms for the first time yeah <laughs> that's when i first had like that's like when i actually got into real estate no Not, way no joke like I, I took shrooms at a concert i became like a philosopher and i was like you know what <laughs> school sucks yeah, i'm done yeah. i'm done with uh i'm done with um organic chemistry yeah. i'm gonna change my major to communication and i'm gonna graduate college as fast as possible and go into real estate dude I, that's it, it's so similar really so similar so when i was in college i again i almost didn't graduate again yeah and then i started doing stand-up my motivation was like i need to graduate so i can focus on stand-up yeah because like uh, like I still wanted to finish and get the degree, but mainly so that like if I did stand up and everything, like I I didn't do college for nothing. Yeah. But yeah, similar thing. I just wanted to graduate to go do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, how long were you a music teacher for? Because I remember in your bio, you're like, I was sick of teaching like Taylor Swift songs to kids. Yeah, That's yeah. all I was about. <laughs> <laughs> I was. Uh, well, it's funny because like I taught, you know, I, my the voice studio I worked at it was anything from like age five to like 60 or whatever, but it was mostly like teenage girls who would come in and want to learn pop songs. Got it. And at that time, the biggest song was like Taylor Swift, I think uh, Blank Page. 
Oh, you remember that song? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, and like all this. So I actually I did enjoy it because I was doing stand up at the time. So I would teach a lesson on my like keyboard, uh, teach scales and stuff. But then when they would leave, I would like write jokes and songs like in that little studio room. Mm -hmm. So it was like the most creative, like, I mean, like this space, you know, you can be in it, be creative, get your thoughts, your ideas, yeah. like plan your goals and do some David Goggins stuff. Like, I ain't no bitch. I'm going to, I'm going <laughs> to go hard into this. But, uh, it was like my, my haven. But yeah, I did that from like, man, how long, maybe two to two years or so. Uh huh. So I was really lucky to like go into stand up pretty hard, like pretty quickly. I started doing colleges, like performing at colleges and that paid decently where you were like, okay, I could make a living off this if I book a lot of colleges. Yeah. And if you don't, then you're like, all right, well, I'm not going to make a lot of money this month. But, um, so yeah, not, not crazy long, maybe like two or three years was doing it. And did you play music your whole life? Yeah. I started playing like uh, piano in eighth grade, but I didn't stick with it. And then I switched to drums like that same year. Uh huh. And then guitar in high school because my girlfriend at the time she like talked about how one of my friends was playing guitar mm -hmm. and she was like oh that's so cute he's playing guitar <laughs> like, i could fucking do that <laughs> that's not that hard <laughs> and then so uh, funny so I, I learned guitar a lot of the skills that i learned as a kid looking back was to impress a girl like i, I learned drums for the same reason my, wow. my friend was at a talent show you know he's not not a bad looking guy but like he started playing drums at the talent show and all the girls started like fawning over him. Like, I can fucking do that, dude. I swear I can do that. So like, yeah, I want to look back. So many of these random skills, it started out like I'm going to impress this girl I have a crush on. And then I eventually like loved the instrument. Yeah. But yeah, so drums, guitar, piano. And I started learning some bass over like the recent years just so I could learn how to produce like beats and stuff. Well, dude, you're a really fucking good singer, too. Like, oh, thanks, how man. long have you been singing for? Oh, it's Filipinos, man. It's in our blood. We yeah. have to. <laughs> it, it, yeah, yeah. It is. It, it yeah. is. So many Americans got talent singers or Filipinos. I know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I feel like they're, they're slowly becoming on the map, like yeah. Filipinos and everything. But uh, yeah, I, I started singing in like church choir. That's how I did it. Like, I went really? to Catholic school wow. from kindergarten to my senior year in high school. So you've been singing forever. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, a long time. Mm -hmm. Do you think singing is a natural born talent or could it be a learned skill? It can be learned for sure. Really? Yeah. I say that with a hundred percent confidence. I think like, cause when I, I started doing lessons in college and that's where I thought that you couldn't learn it. And then I started to see, okay, you can learn it. I mean, it definitely is hard because like working out and learning a, a, a physical skill, yeah. you can like see the movements with singing. It's all like, in your, you know, vocal cords, vocal folds, all that stuff. So it's like, you don't really, you can't see what you're doing. You have to do it by like feel or, or like a thought to dictate the, the actions that you're doing. Yeah. So it's really tough. And I think there might be a, depending on your teacher, your coach and your own natural ability, there's probably a ceiling I would say for a lot of people. Yeah. And maybe you can get past that ceiling, but it's just like, there's some people have a better starting point Got it. and an ability to learn it than others. Um, yeah. So that's cool. But definitely I think it can be learned. Do you think comedy is a learned skill or a natural born talent? I think they're, they're both very similar where you can learn like joke writing. You can learn like certain tools within like stand up especially, but there has to be some innate thing like comedically. Yeah. I can't even explain. It's so hard to explain it. Like, you gotta have like good personality. Yeah. Like you gotta like be a likable person on stage. For sure. Yeah. Likeability is a big part of it. Yeah. Cause you can be talking about the most messed up thing, dark comedy, whatever, dark topic, but there's, they can feel when your intentions are good yeah. and like where it's coming from that makes it likable. Yeah. That's, I think that's part of the natural part. That's hard to teach. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I hope you're enjoying the show, but I wanted to announce this giveaway I'm doing. So if you're listening on the podcast and you leave a five-star review and leave some comments on the show on Spotify or on Apple Podcasts to help the algorithm and to help reach more amazing people like yourself, to help more people, I am doing a $1,000 giveaway at the end of every month to help grow this podcast faster than it has been. So if you enjoy the show and you're getting value from the episodes, I'd greatly appreciate a five-star review 
and to motivate you, you have a chance of winning $1,000 for taking 10 seconds to leave a positive review on the podcast. Thank you so much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. Dude, I was laughing so hard when like you made that Jackie Chan joke. <laughs> so funny. Oh, can can yeah, you do yeah. that one real quick, bro? What's the, which one? Is it the one about... Uh... It's like, oh, I, are you up there, Jackie Chan? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I do the thing where I'm like looking up dude, like, yeah, to see that if... Was, dude, yeah. I, my girlfriend and I were like on the floor. Like, I, Where were you guys sitting I at the show? I started crying. I was like middle, kind of middle back. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 We, we, we saw you backstage. We're like, oh, like... My, my girlfriend's like, should we say hi to him? Should we say hi to him? I was like, oh, no. y'all should have, bro. I was like, no, no, no. We don't want to like bother him. Like, you know, yeah, like he's yeah. too famous. No, no, not at all. <laughs> not at all, dude. It's so funny. People think like when people want to come take a picture on the street, yeah. they think like, oh, I don't want to bother you. Like, bro, let's hang out. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. like, let's talk. But uh, yeah, no, like that. I'm going to do it in the specials. I probably can't talk about it. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> but the, um, it's so funny. It's dude. the interesting thing with stand up is like you're building and you're building and like the game is changing now, but usually you would save it until you put it out on a special so that way like if you do a live show people aren't like oh i already heard that yeah but um it's changing now because of social media you kind yeah, of put things out quicker see it. yeah yeah but because i know i'm putting out a special in december i'm like being like more like safe with some material and yeah. then gonna release it all but bro that was such a fun show man i don't know if you remember like that that white girl in the front with her yeah, <laughs> yeah dude you were picking her the whole time that was so funny was she dude. taking it well yeah she yeah, was she yeah. was she was really nice i feel i feel bad because i might have like gone too hard at some moments what was her name again oh, it was man. like montana right yeah dude <laughs> <laughs> you're just making fun of how white she was. Her name's yeah, Montana. Yeah. Oh my god! Because like it's like her name was even like the whitest state in the country. Yeah. yeah. Oh man. I remember like, you said something like like cheer if you're like Asian or like Indian or something. And she's she like cheered. yeah yeah. She yeah. cheered and you're like what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> oh man, they were cool. I met them like after the show too. Their group was like really nice. Really, they're, they're sweet. Yeah. That was so funny, man. Um, but like, where is your special going to be aired? Like, what like what is that? Yeah. So I don't know yet. So what we're I'm doing like kind of the like a similar like a joe coy method where with his first special where he like taped it and like kind of produced it all himself i'm working with a a company that uh, that did my album oh. 800 pound gorilla and then we're gonna shop it around after that and then honestly though like a lot of specials have been doing really well on youtube so that's like a big possibility especially with building like how i built the online part yeah but i, I really don't know man i'm kind of like surfing this a little bit like i don't I'm trusting the whole process of where it's going to go. Yeah. But we're going to tape it in December and then kind of go from there. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And you have an album called Dual Citizen, right? Mm hmm Yeah. It was debuted number one on iTunes and yes, Billboard sir. comedy charts. Yeah. That's an amazing feat, dude. Yeah. Thanks, man. That was, uh, what, like 2017, I think, that we, we put that out. Uh-huh. And, um, yeah, it was crazy. I remember when I saw like the number one thing and like the stuff that it was next to, I was like, oh, this is pretty wild. But yeah, yeah, it was a cool, cool accomplishment. How do you think it got that big? Like, you know, it's really this record label that I was working with, oh, really? uh, 800 pound gorilla who's uh -huh. now doing a bunch of specials and they're going to do my special this year. They just knew the tricks of the trade of like how to, how to like, how to release stuff, how to get like people to buy it at the time because it was like iTunes and stuff is really the way which is it's so different now yeah I don't it's all Spotify now. yeah Spotify like yeah. I don't think I've listened to this I don't know if I should be saying like brand stuff on here, you know? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know who I'm gonna be trying to work all, with in the yeah. next year but but the truth is yeah like I don't really use iTunes necessarily now but um they knew how to release it on like iTunes and I don't like the timing of things they just they just really knew like analytics really well it yeah. was I was so impressed they knew the game super well and um I got to just focus on making the like creative part of it. What was your most like successful track? Probably the song I had called Interracial Babies. Interracial Babies? Yeah. Yeah. What about Asian Guys Can Smash? Oh, dude, Asian Guys <laughs> unreleased, dude. Unreleased. It's unreleased? Not yeah. Oh, really? Well, so it is out on like YouTube and stuff, but uh -huh. I haven't necessarily put out like a track like on Spotify or anything. Okay. I'll maybe this is like a good way to like manifest it is like what I want to do when I put out the special is like put out a bunch of music videos and studio versions of the songs. Uh -huh. So that way, like, they're all kind of promoting each other. Got it. So I'll make, like, an in-studio version of Asian Guys Can Smash, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a funny title. That's for us, dude, you yeah. know? Dude, <laughs> I feel that to the core, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, because, like, it's, you know, when... I don't know how it was, like, growing up in your school and everything, but it was, like... I remember I started to notice it was, like, a thing where, like, 
Asian men were always put down as like the nerds or you're just like yeah. an asexual martial artist. Yeah. Which is crazy because why would you be like a dude who can like fight and you're like strong and all that stuff, but like, oh, but I don't sleep with women, you know, that's <laughs> uh, no, not my thing. And like girls aren't attracted. So yeah. I like, I wrote that song at a time where I was like, you know what, let's get some like Asian male representation and like, yeah. uh, I don't know, just show that we can be, like be uh, be sex symbols, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you, you dealt with some racism growing up too, right? A little bit, a little bit. A little bit. Yeah, it's it's funny. Like you always like minimize it when you're growing up. Then when you look back, you're like, oh, that's kind of fucked up. Yeah, yeah. You take yeah. it as a joke back then. Yes. You're like, oh wait, like that was pretty bad. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I joke about like now how it the slurs got more and more progressive though. Like yeah. in the in the beginning, somebody yeah. called me like Speedy Gonzalez. I'm like, damn, a Mexican mouse. Like, come on. And then eventually they're like, oh, Jeremy Lin. It's like, all right, he's like Taiwanese. You're getting closer. Yeah. And then when I uh, got older, they were like, hey, Manny Pacquiao. I'm like, there we go. <laughs> there, <laughs> there we, we go. go. We're there. We made it. Yeah, you, we made it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, one thing I really um, like that you said is like, what is it? It's um, ignor ignorance plus fear equals mm -hmm. racism, right? Yeah. Right. Because, yeah, I mean, if you're afraid of it and you don't know anything about it, yeah, that makes sense. That's what creates that kind of slurs and language. For sure. Yeah. Because yeah. it is like, I mean, it's like a very tribal thing where you're like, oh, they're, it's they, they're different yeah. than us. Yeah. So, and so they're like the enemy. I'm afraid of them. But then when you see how many similarities you have, you're like, oh, we're all actually in the same tribe. Yeah. So many similarities. Yeah. 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 Did you, did you deal with stuff too, like growing up? More like my friends would make jokes and I kind of, you know, kind of like brush you, it off to the side. You almost learn how to joke with them. Yeah. To, as like a, yeah. Yeah. But there were some. Yeah, there was definitely some serious altercations, but um, mm. most of it was like jokingly. Right. But uh, definitely a significant amount for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Pro probably similar. What high me. school did you go to? Uh, Jesuit. Jesuit. High I mean, school. sorry. What? Um, Grade school. Yeah. Middle, middle school. I went to. Uh, it was a Catholic school, St. John the Evangelist. Okay. Yeah, in Sacramento. Were you like in like the Granite Bay area or? So we we started out in like Fair Oaks, Carmichael. Okay. And then eventually it. moved to Granite Bay. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. I think the. Like the nice area up there's like El Dorado Hills, right, or something. El Dorado Hills, yeah, yeah. It's like it's like so beautiful. I had a, a buddy who lived out there, and the view is insane from like the back. Really, yeah, yeah, nice. Do you have an ocean view from your new house you're moving into? So we don't have an ocean view, but it's like a ten minute walk to it, which we're yeah. like, all right, I'll take it. That's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. You know what? I don't know how you feel about this with real estate and like houses out here, right? Every, I feel like every house near the ocean should have a deck. Oh, for sure. You gotta have a deck. You gotta have a it's deck. It's a waste of space. You don't have a deck. Yeah, because we don't. We don't have a deck. Uh -huh. But like, but we're also we, we couldn't see it even if we did. Uh huh. But I feel like if you're near, you gotta have a deck. Yeah. No, I agree. Yeah. Decks are amazing. Yeah. Yeah. When are you gonna move into the new house? So right now, the date that we get the keys is October 28. So in about a month ish. Yeah. Got it. And why'd you pick San Diego to settle? Settle down. <sighs> Man, that's a good question, dude. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very spontaneous. Like, so. It was really because I think it's like, I, I still don't necessarily feel settled down, even though I have the house. Um, I, yeah. I mean, even watching your stuff, like I see it kind of more of, it's like, yeah, I want to live, but also like an investment yeah. type of thing. So it's a, a mix of, a bit of both. But um, I still see myself like trying to get more properties like in Sacramento near my family or like yeah. other places eventually. But San Diego was, um, this is where I taped my first album. And it's just one of my, been one of my favorite cities in the U.S. for a long time. Like touring, I would always come out here to do shows to work on stuff and then go to the beach. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, why don't I just live there then? <laughs> if that's what I'm going to do for yeah. my career. Yeah. So it's just one of the best cities to like do stand up, have a, a good lifestyle, yeah. a chill vibe with people. Like I've met a lot of cool people out here and like, and then even, you know, I, I was saying before doing this podcast, like I started following your stuff online and I found out, oh, this dude's in San Diego. This dude's like super chill. Like it's cool to see uh, also like an Asian person in real estate, like being the face of it. Cause I think of shows like even like selling sunset or something, you know, like, yeah, yeah. where's like the, like the, the Asian version of this. I think there is something. I, yeah, forget, I don't know. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. But like million dollar listing. Everyone's, you know, everyone's white, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's crazy. Cause like, obviously Asians are high achieving. We're going to be killing it, in it yeah. somehow. Yeah. So it's like, it's, there's like also diversity here too, where like I went to Nashville recently and I was like, Oh, I love this city. There's a lot of life here, live music performance, but it wasn't just, just real reality right now. It's not as diverse as, yeah. as like San Diego. 
Yeah. And so I really love more of that mix of like people yeah. here. Yeah, too. So you want to invest in more real estate though. That's cool to hear. I do. It's man. the best yeah. way to put your money, man, or yeah. invest your money. I got yeah. I to ask you about that because I'm getting my feet wet in it, but I don't know too much about it. Yeah. But I know that like, I, I want to keep building that like portfolio of real estate stuff. Well, dude, you got a great start. I mean, look, when you buy in an area like Windensea or Bird mm -hmm. Rock where they're not building, they're not making any more houses out there. Mm. Uh, I don't know if you know, but there's something called, do you know what the Coastal Commission is? Mm -hmm. So what the Coastal Commission is, is like anything near the, the water in, in California. Yeah. You have what's called the Coastal Commission. It's like a committee of older people, older white <laughs> folks. I, I can see the part in your head where you're like, do I say this? Yeah, do I say but, this? Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. you know, PG, yeah. Um, they're <laughs> against anything new. So they're against, but it's good for you though, because they make it very hard for developers to build mm -hmm. near like in beach cities. Yeah. So the supply and demand in beach cities is very favorable towards demand. Mm. So when there's a lot of demand, no like supply. No, no matter what it is in the rest of the market, like this market is always going to be high demand Hot, because of Always. That. Always, mm. because everyone wants to be by the beach. Who doesn't? The weather's the best by the beach. Mm. And the quality of life is the best, like you said. And when you can't build there, it creates a perfect storm for a new owner like yourself mm. to sell that property for significantly more when you mm. sell it five, 10 years down the line. Or if you, you keep it forever, great. But what I'm trying to get at is it was a great investment because they're not building mm. near the beach. Like, yeah, we noticed like things would go on and then sell really quick, like out so there. fast. So that's that's why I went and saw it before the pictures were even released. Yeah, yeah. in California as a whole, there's a huge housing crisis. Like there's not enough housing out there. Mm. So when you buy in a in a class A area like that, like you're gonna do great. What do you recommend, like as far as holding on to it or selling it, like because everyone says just like like you just hold on to it forever, yeah, type of thing, and. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Like, what do you like strategy wise with it? What do you recommend? I'm always opportunistic. Mm -hmm. It's all real estate's all numbers based for me. So, mm -hmm. wherever I can get the highest amount of return, I'm going to do. Okay. Is that keeping it? Is that selling it? Is that refinancing it? I always look at those three options. Mm. And let's say you got a crazy offer like tomorrow for like 2.2 .2 million. Let's yeah. say you made a million bucks in less than. Two months strike, of holding it. Strike because the iron's hot at that. Yeah. Like if someone's willing to pay such a high price and your return on the money you put in, like what was your down payment on that? Down payment was, we did 20%. So what? Let's call it 300 grand. Yeah. Yeah. Somewhere around there. Yeah. So on 300 grand, if you made a million bucks, you like more than tripled your money. Mm, so, yeah. you know, if the returns outweigh um, what you can make in the future now, then it mm -hmm. makes sense. So, but right. here's the thing, you, you, you'll never go wrong holding it for a long time because sure. the location's amazing. But here's what I would do. Do you want to live there forever? Probably not, right? Probably not, yeah. Yeah. I, I would eventually want to have like a home with land and space and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But how long do you realistically see yourself living there for? I don't, at least the next two to three years. Two to three years. At least, at least yeah. And, and definitely there's an opportunity for more, for sure. But my my predicted like space of, okay, I want to use it for this long is probably two to three years. Got it. So let's say in two to three years, it's worth 2 million bucks. Mm -hmm. um, what's cool is when you move out of the house and you claim it as a rental property and there's a tenant living there and renting it from you or even mm -hmm. a short-term rental, someone's Airbnb being it, which would do great in that market, right? Yeah. Once you do that for at least, you know, two tax years, you can sell it and not pay any capital gains tax mm. and put all the profits into a bigger property. So you can oh, put it cool. into like a fourplex or whatever you want. Okay. And that's how I've grown my portfolio really quick. It's called a 1031 exchange. Have you heard of it? I think I, I saw one of your videos on it. Yeah, <laughs> like, it's, it's super well, powerful. This, like, yeah, you should look yeah. into it. It's called a 1031. And so you have to do wait, it's at least two years and have it as a rental property. Yeah, so you have to claim it on your like on your tax return as a rental for at least like one or two years. Okay, gotcha. And because let's say you were to sell your house and cash out, you have to pay capital gains, right? Mm -hmm. Although you, if you're married, are you married? No, we're uh, just together, but together. Married, yeah. If you were married, you'd have a, you know, like a capital gains shelter of 500 grand. Oh, wow. But, you know, the way to pay no tax is to uh, do the 1031 exchange. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so that is little, little tips that help so much. Yeah, man. Yeah. Because like, if you keep rolling that money, because you're young, if you keep rolling that money for 10, 20 years, you know, that money could be in like a 20 unit apartment complex yeah. with 20 tenants paying I remember rent. seeing that in one of your videos too. That's yeah. where I followed you because I was like, oh, it's so cool the way that you're doing it. You know, yeah. it's like uh, the, the way that you think of real estate, I, I really like. 
Like yeah. here's like the, like my mentor told me this and um, it stayed with me forever is like, when you're 80 years old and you are not working at all, mm -hmm. would you rather have income from four tenants or from 400 tenants? Mm. Because if 400 people are paying you rent versus four people, you're going to make a lot more money. For sure. And you're going to have a management company handling it. So you're very hands off. Right. But, um, I'm all about having as many tenants as possible paying me rent by the time I'm retired yeah. to where I'll never have an issue with money. Yeah. Cause I mean, you can do stand up comedy for a very, very long time, but you don't want to do it when you're like, in oh, your that's 80s, the thing is, like, right? I think about that even now where I'm like, I was really lucky to have this capital even now with stand up. And yeah. it's like, but I don't want to just like have it be something where there's like, there's no, I'm not building any assets. Yeah. Like, I want to start thinking about that now instead of like, oh, three years later, I'm like, oh, that was nice when I had that money. You know? Like, yeah. Yeah. Cause, cause I don't, the seasons can change. I don't know. And like, for sure, I definitely believe in it enough to keep building. But I want to be smart financially starting now. Yeah, to build for the future. Yeah, and at some point, yeah, I don't want to have to be dependent on touring either. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to, like have a family and all that stuff. Yeah. So when do you want to have a family? Let's get started. <laughs> 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 no, I mean it's funny. I've always been a family guy. Yeah. But but I have to also be real with the lifestyle that I have right now. So I'm patient with it. I, I could probably do it in the next like four or five years or so. Maybe five, eight, six years. Maybe ten. <laughs> yeah. going up, but yeah, no, I, I think it would have to be, there would be, have to be a few like projects that I want to have already done. Yeah. But then you really don't know. It really is like, I think it's just a feeling too. I think uh, when you know, you know that yeah. type of thing. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I would like to be financially stable where it's not just touring. I'd like it. to have a few assets or like some like royalties yeah. uh, in the industry or something. But yeah, I don't know. That's a, it's a, I think I thought I would have kids already when I was younger. <laughs> yeah. Cause like my parents had us when they were like in their early twenties, they started young, you know, like, you're like early thirties right now, right? Early thirties. I'm yeah. uh, I just turned 33. No, I just turned 30, 33 this year. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So I think like, I don't want to have a kid later than my forties though. So I want to be, be able to play with them and like yeah. when I'm older. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Gotcha. For the people that, don't know when your tour dates are. You have one in San Diego coming up, right? Yeah, yeah. When's the one in San Diego coming up? San Diego is like, October fourteenth. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the first show is almost sold out, so we added a second show after it. Oh, really? Yeah, we're doing it. We at, got tickets to that. Oh, yeah. The, which one? The nine o'clock or the seven o'clock? Uh, I think we're the seven o'clock. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, gotcha. yeah we'll, okay. so we'll be there, dude. Come say hi, man. Yeah, yeah we'll we'll figure something out. Yeah. Yeah, you, you got to meet my cousin too. You guys would, dude. You guys would hit it off. There was something you said before that was like, oh yeah, you guys would love each other. That's uh, it's October fourteenth at Balboa Theater. Yeah, yeah, that's mm -hmm. gonna be awesome. Yeah, man, you're touring right now, right? Like, yeah, as we speak. So I, yeah. s I'm on a, sh I was on a short break, but I was, I was working out material on like showcases and stuff. But my actual shows, I start again this Wednesday. Mm. I start traveling Wednesday. Got it. So I'll do, I'm doing Albany, Niagara Falls, New York, Boston, Connecticut. And then that's the East Coast run. And then I'm doing Sacramento, San Diego, Santa Barbara, San Francisco. And wow. then it's, yeah, what is this? I, I have this memorized. Seattle, Portland, Vancouver, Vegas, or Hawaii, and then Vegas. Is that like one a week, right? Pretty much, pretty much. It's actually, it's multiple cities in the week. So this weekend I'm doing Albany and like Niagara Falls. Wow. And the next weekend is Boston and Connecticut. Wow. It's yeah. a lot of traveling. Dude, that's why I've been trying to like rest up and do shows in town. That's how, that's how basically how we connected. Yeah. Was uh, that show that you came to, like all workout stuff locally to go do on the road, basically. Mm, yeah. How much different will the material be from what I heard then to... Uh... So the stuff that you heard will be pretty like, it'll, it's, it's similar but different because I also did a lot of crowd work. Yeah. So that part's always going to be different. Yeah. But the, so the two songs that I did... It's kind of like how I open up the show and mm -hmm. how I'll open up the special. And then after that, it's like a whole different hour. Got it. Yeah, man. That's cool. Yeah. I'm excited. Yeah, bro. That's I'm excited for that show too because uh, I think like like a bunch of my cousins are coming. My family out here is coming and everything. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Is your cousin local in San Diego? Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, uh, he lives in UTC. UTC. UTC area. Yeah. Cool, man. That's awesome. Yeah. Where, do you, where, do you, where are you out here? 
I'm like right up the street. I'm in Kensington. Oh, sick. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Dope. We got, dude, we gotta like all hang out. Out yeah, here. we do. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It'll be fun. Yeah. My girlfriend really wants, dude, she's like your biggest fan right now. <laughs> dude, she watches like we your TikToks date. all the time. No way. Like That's all so the funny. time. She's always on your TikTok. I'm like, what are you watching? Like, you're laughing so much. <laughs> I'm watching JR. Like, <laughs> it's so great. Bro, that's so funny. I yeah. wish, that's why, like, yeah, it's so cool, man. It, I love this stuff because I was like, I was already a fan of yours before you even came to the show. Really? Yeah, man. man. I was like, I was watching your stuff, trying to figure out how to buy a house. And then, like, I was even telling my cousin some stuff. I was like, you got to check this guy out. Like, he seems really smart about the way he's doing it. Like you're young, Asian dude also. It's just yeah. like, there's so many things that were groundbreaking with what you're doing. Yeah. So it's cool to hear that you guys, you know, end up becoming fans of my stuff too. Yeah. That's amazing, man. If the audience wants to, um, if the listener wants to, um, find your stuff, your content on Instagram, TikTok, what's yeah. your username? Instagram is J R D G U Z J R D Guz. Cause my full name is J R D Guzman. And then TikTok is J R D Guz also, but J R D E G U Z. And then um, you can find all the like socials also just on my website, J R D Got it. And you're yeah. pretty big on YouTube too. Yeah, YouTube has grown a lot. That's yeah. that's the reason why we're thinking of doing a YouTube special. Is just like all these other platforms are really great. It would be awesome. I'd love to, but the YouTube is built up to like we're almost at four hundred thousand. It's like three hundred seventy. So like I feel like we could do really well putting it out there and getting some exposure. Yeah. I just want to put the special where as many people as possible can see it. Cause it's like an hour that I've been building for a few years now and I'm like really proud of. Yeah. So I, I, I don't want to put it out and then it's like, all right, no one saw it, but you got paid. You know, it's like, I, I want to invest in this to be like, yo, I want people to see this. I, I really want it to be like something that, I don't know, just like a milestone for me. Like, Hey, I'm proud of this. I hope as many people can see it as possible. Yeah. Yeah. And YouTube's a great platform to do that because I mean YouTube is powerful, man. Like once it gets views and you know you have that audience retention, it just like yeah. they promote it like crazy for you. I, it's so funny. I like it's uh, that's where I almost started my career because I had a video go viral on YouTube like 2015, huh. but I never posted after that. I was just like, oh, this is cool. Wow. Um, somebody shared it on Reddit, and then the next day it had like 300,000 views, and I was like, oh, that's so weird. Like. Everything else I have has like seven views and <laughs> and six of them are me. <laughs> so uh, so it's kind of a cool full circle to like be able to put stuff out on YouTube now. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Can we uh, end the podcast with a little bit of a, a song? Yeah, yeah, sure, man. A little bit of performance? Let's see, improvise something? Yeah, yeah. I mean, what's some good topics? We've been talking about houses and what's that exchange rule? Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> 1031. <laughs> Let me see. I'll do the uh, Asian guys can smash. Um, oh, hell yeah. The chords. Let's go. Woo. Yeah, yeah, baby. You don't want to go home with a guy with an apartment, no. <laughs> 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 you got to learn how to own. And Jason going to help you buy. Oh, Jason, yeah, yeah. Going to help you with that. 1041 exchange. Is that what it's called? 1031. 1031. I'm, oh, I like that you sang it. <laughs> <laughs> like 1031. 31. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, baby. Look for a guy with a mortgage. And even if he renting, that's okay. But eventually, gotta learn how to own, baby. All right, what else we got? Roast well, me a little bit. Roast you? <laughs> Roast me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, you're sadistic, bro. You're like, roast me. Roast me. <laughs> oh, Jason. I can't roast you, bro. I love you too much, man. <laughs> Jason. Yeah, yeah. Ooh. I'm trying to think of something. Oh, yeah. And got a white girlfriend, too. <laughs> <laughs> We're both race traders. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, dude. <laughs> Oh, I can't. I can't keep going. That's so funny, man. What's your girlfriend's name again? Christina. Christina, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Oh. I can't, I can't, that's it. That's it. I can't roast her, dude. <laughs> no, nah, man. Yeah, yeah. That's all I got right now. That's funny, dude. Yeah. Thanks, dude, you're bro. so good, man. Thank you so much for coming on, bro. Hey, it's thank so you, So much fun. It's just, it's a pleasure, dude. Like, again, I respect everything you're doing. So I was like, oh, I got to come. I don't, I don't go on a lot of podcasts. But I was like, I'm going to go on here. Really? Yeah, yeah. Man, I'm honored. Thank you. Yeah, I, I knew sure. it was, um, I know how busy you are, so I, I appreciate it. And, uh, I got to take you up on that double date. Yeah, man. I'm going to hold seriously. you to that. That'd be we'll so go. fun. We'll go. Yeah. My girlfriend's always like down to go out and stuff. So hell yeah, bro. Yeah. Thank you, JR. Cool. Thanks, Thanks brother. Bro. Yeah. Appreciate you.